Welcome to the Centuries of Sound radio podcast, the mid-monthly show where we discuss and give some context to these records. My lord and gentlemen, Centuries of Sound. If you enjoy these programs, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. For $5 or local equivalent per month, you can get full downloads of mixes and these radio podcasts a year earlier. Centuries of Sound is an independent podcast without any advertising, and it's only with the support of patrons that the show can survive. Find out more at patreon.com slash centuries of sound. This show was recorded in January 2019, features Sean, and covers the music of 1894 and 1895. Centuries of Sound on Cambridge 105 Radio. Hello and welcome to Centuries of Sound. I'm James. And I'm Sean. And this is the show where we take a trip back in time to a year of recorded sound using original recordings only. And uh, once again, we are on two years today. Which years are those? 1894 to 1895. So the first half of today we're going to talk about and listen to recordings from 1894. So, Sean, what can you tell us about the year 1894? Well, it's an interesting year. I think in many ways you can say this begins countdown to World War War one uh, in, mm, we start right. off the year with a military alliance between France and Russia, which later becomes the um, Entente Cordiale between England, France and Russia, or the United Kingdom, I should say. We have the, I'm going to mangle this, the Dongbak Peasant Rebellion in Korea, oh. in which China and Japan then steamroller in, um, ostensibly to help the local dynasty, but in reality to curve up Korea. Oh, that uh, particular corner of Asia uh, saw many of the flashpoints of uh, the first and second half of the 20th century yeah. as well so yes mm. more locally we have the local government act in march the first which gives women the right to vote in local but not national elections for the first time right okay i wasn't uh, aware of that the united states is paralyzed in this year by un- unemployment strikes uh coxley's army marches on washington you have the railroad strikes miners strikes the u.s seems to be pretty strike heavy this year because um, we had the uh the crash the previous year yes so the united states economy right. is not doing too well and president grover cleveland is doing his level best to not do anything um mm-hmm. the uh prevailing government ideology at the time is very much of laissez-faire that all the government could do is sit and watch and wait for the economy to um rebalance itself but that does of course mean that a lot of people are starving and dying and saying why aren't you doing anything oh so we were on the verge of the progressive era yes. after this yes so, uh... indeed uh the start of this period just the start of the progressive era um and another news the site of the 1893 world columbia expo which we featured last time we had a regular mm-hmm. series burned down this year sadly oh yes yes quite soon after it had closed yes uh, which is a shame of course and but... talking of people who burn things down nicholas the second Tsar of Russia succeeds his father today on November the 1st, 1894. The right. last Tsar of Russia. So quite a, an ominous year in some ways, mm. we could say. But we do have the uh, Edwardian era to come before that war, yes. so um, it's, it's not, not just round the corner yet. So as far as sound goes, we're coming out of the experimental era into a time when it is starting to become something that is not just for uh, innovators or hobbyists. So 1894 saw the launch of the uh, Graphophone G, the Baby Grand. It was the first machine designed for home entertainment and it sold for a massive $75.00. Or a hundred dollars with a horn, a listening tube, and a set of records, which you, you would imagine you would need either a horn or a listening tube. A listening tube is like a stethoscope. A horn, you, you can imagine what that is. Um, and yeah, it was an amazing device because it allowed the playing of both competing standards of cylinder, Edison cylinders and Columbia cylinders. Wow. We're still talking about cylinders here, not disc records, um, which are being developed by Emil Berliner. But he put them on sale, first of all, the first time that disc records have ever been on sale was in November 1894. Um, But they're still very much a minority thing. They won't take off for a few years yet. Of course, very little of this would have filtered through into your average household. But for well-off, forward-thinking types, uh, first adopters of new gadgets, having this device in your house was was now at least an option. It was there for you. If you wanted entertainment in most houses, there was the piano in the drawing room and that you could play that yourself. Sheet music was still the main way to consume music. But the shift from this home musicianship to mass consumption of recorded sound, it's finally kind of begun. 
Edison was still the main company making cylinders and making the equipment to play them on. And uh, as an organization, they like to advertise themselves. Isla's Orchestra were Edison's house band. We say they were a parlor orchestra, so basically a band. And this is uh, an advertisement, I think you could say, for Mm. another Edison product, which is the electric light, which had now taken off quite hugely across the world, of course. And uh, it's the electric light quadrille. Okay, so that's the electric light quadrille played by Edison's house band, Isla's Orchestra. Not exactly an advertisement, as I was uh, describing it at first. More of a, a barn dance, we could say, <laughs> but with a with an advertising theme of the electric light. I guess if you're having a barn dance in you the need a light, uh, yeah, you you might need light because it might be in the evening, um, possibly, I or think indoors. Advert- I think advertising is still very much in its infancy as well at this point. <laughs> yes, yes. We have the first uh, film advert uh, for for Dewar's Scotch a couple of years after this, which is some men dancing in kilts. That's that's basically it. <laughs> well, in 1894, we do have uh, a famous film. It's not not the first film, and not not one of them, not one of the first films even. But it's the arrival of a train, um, which is famously the audience was standing up and scared that the train was going to hit them um how much that's actually true or not is really a matter of debate it's uh, one of those things that's probably an urban myth but it's uh, one of the most famous films from the early days of cinema is from this year one of the things you might notice is that we still have this kind of uh, marching band music we have a bit less of it this time but it's still the dominant musical form we do also have some of the pop music of the era and uh, one of the biggest pop hits of this year was written by an Englishman. It's uh, Daisy Bell. You might know Daisy Bell. I imagine you do. Yes, I'm pretty sure everyone does. I, I performed it at my uh, year six school play, um, which is just its enduring popularity. As all British pop songs go, they always seem to be turned into dirty versions. There were several dirty versions involving writing various other things mm-hmm. two by two. Uh, and indeed a song from the perspective of the of Daisy. Right, which um, sung to I think it's Harry who says you're effectively says you're mad if you think I'm going to marry you or you can afford. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tandem. Okay, well, <laughs> but it's a uh, yeah. Harry will be uh, Harry Dacre. Yeah, it's the the songwriter of uh, of the song. He wrote it a couple of years before this, but mm. it, it really took off in this year. And um, yeah, it was um, 
said to have been inspired by Daisy Greville, Countess of Warwick, um, who was uh, one of uh, Edward, the, the future King Edward the Seventh's mis- mistress, apparently. Yeah, he did his bit to repopulate the English aristocracy in those years. <laughs> uh-huh, really indeed, indeed. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's an English songwriter, but he uh, he wrote it in the USA strangely enough mm. um the story of it, the, the story behind it is that he brought with him a bicycle and uh, he was surprised to find that he was charged import duty on the bicycle he brought over with him and uh another songwriter William Jerome was a friend of his he said uh, well it's lucky you didn't bring a bicycle built for two otherwise you'd have to pay double duty so he oh, a bicycle built for two hmm, that's a an interesting phrase um so then uh, wrote a song around that <laughs> shall we shall we hear daisy bell Let's it's hear it. not not the best recording of it i'm afraid but um it's it's what we've got it's by um edward m favor that uh singer of lugubrious ballads from this era and uh yeah an american as well but this was soon taking off on the musical stage and he was an english writer so um we can call it a, a transatlantic hit All right, so there's Edward M. Favor's version of Daisy Bell. Not the snappiest of performances of that particular song, I would say. But a record we have of a song that's popular in those days and still well-known enough now that people might be familiar with mm. it. I imagine some people, the first time they've heard that, it's perfectly possible. I think, uh, I think it's a very popular song to learn to play on the recorder. Mm, yes, is it? Yeah. Very simple notes, yes, yeah. that's... Um, do people still play their recorder in school? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's a way to get out of maths. Okay, um, uh, yeah. Um, we were talking about um, Edward M. Favor's singing voice. It's uh, really kind of, it's, you can tell he's used to projecting to a large room who want to hear all the words. In a sense, it comes across well on a cylinder because he has a, mid, a mid-toned voice, doesn't mm. go up or down and it doesn't, um, yeah, doesn't go wrong for that reason but it's a bit of a tiresome thing to listen to all the same isn't it yeah we were wondering weren't we whether the tremor in his voice is because of the warping of the cylinders or whether it's just the way he sings i think most likely that's how he sings Mm. um but it's uh yeah it's it's a voice with character we could say um although not necessarily a character that we desirable (laughs) i'm afraid so the choice of things to record you can tell is still not amazing we're still getting the kind of novelty records and uh this is this is one of the hits of the year but it's still kind of a novelty record and the only place people are taking recording music seriously still is russia where we have this guy julius block who is still recording all of his friends in uh, moscow and st petersburg let's have a listen to a couple of pieces by a uh, violin player anton Orensky, and uh, pianist and composer jules konus those are two of the uh, n- not the biggest names from russia in this time but they're still big names that you may have heard of
So very nice stuff coming from Russia there. Um, Anton Orensky and Jules Konas, both recorded by the uh, hero of mine, Julius Bloch, who was actually recording nice stuff at this time. Uh, the Russian kind of area, was there much going on at that time? You've already said that there's a change of Tsar in well, this yeah. year. Tsar Nicholas II comes to the throne. He largely continues the conservative authoritarian figures of his father, uh, mm-hmm. the policy of his father. Uh, for this time, the... for this time at least. Yes, yeah. for this time at least. He re- Upon his accession, he receives a delegation from various peasants, etc., saying, please, can we have some say in how you rule this country, please? And he effectively says no. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. <laughs> so not much has changed in Russia, though Russia was starting to um, creakingly come to life, hmm. I think. But there are there are a lot of the sort of trouble in what one might call the um, Slavosphere. Sl- yes, the Slavosphere. Certainly, we've we've had um, the Crimean War a couple of years earlier, and Bulgaria, Serbia, etc. Are all okay. Nice. So talking away. talking about the uh, kind of uh, Serbia Bulgaria area, <laughs> Bulgaria area. Yeah, uh, we have uh, a famous play from this year which is set around there it's uh, arms and the man yes um, yeah arguably george bernard shaw's most famous or certainly most most enduring play uh he has three themes in his plays effectively the uh the um economic motivation for prostitution evil landlords and the evils of war um so this covers all of those bases in one way or another in one way or another it? yes um Famously, uh, on opening night, there were huge cheers in the audience, apart from one man who sat there booing, and uh, George Bernard Shaw came on stage and said, My dear fellow, I quite agree with you, but what are we two against so many? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a great great guy for quotes, isn't yes, he, George he is. Bernard Shaw? Um, I, I didn't see this. I, I listened to a recording of it, and uh, I was quite surprised at how uh, funny it was, mm. how kind of light and funny and enjoyable. Yes. I imagined it would be quite a serious play, but it isn't at all. No. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a quite an enjoyable play. Um, and uh, it, it was turned into a musical a little bit later, uh, mm. The Chocolate Soldier, because that's what they call oh, him. Really? Mm. Yeah, because he's he's a Swiss hired soldier. The One of the main characters is this, this kind of Swiss hired soldier. And you think, first of all, he's a too sensitive and uh, doesn't like fighting in the end you find out he's actually the toughest character of them all because he's uh, mm. he's just a pragmatist really he's yeah. go out to fight in different places and doesn't want to get killed he's uh, getting the money so and uh, that that makes him kind of kind of the hero at the end <laughs> i wouldn't say the hero but I don't think there's a... any heroes in it but um yeah it's a it's a very enjoyable bit of theater i think and i'd like to see it in the real setting the term chocolate soldier still used in the Israeli army. Is it? Okay. Um, it sounds a bit dodgy when you first does. hear it, yes. but it, it refers to kind of Swiss chocolate yeah. and uh, the kind of uh, sensitivity of a you know, meltable chocolate shell rather than uh, any kind of racist thing going on there. Um, so war, what's it good for? Uh, Absolutely for, nothing. Well, popular culture. Yeah. It's, it's quite good for various popular culture. Mm. At this time, it's... Uh, the source of lots of bad popular culture there are lots of uh sentimental kind of uh, war ballads which mm. uh I, i'm not going to play you today <laughs> um I, I, what i've what i've put together here is a a sentimental story from the the king of spoken word in the 1890s russell hunting and uh a, a nice kind of uh, instrumental behind it by uh, jules levy um so from russell hunting it's the old man and jim and uh, from Jules Levy, it's The Last Rose of Summer. The old man never had much to say except in the gym. And Jim was one of the wildest boys he had. And the old man just wrapped up in him. Never heard him speak but once or twice in my life. 
The first time was when the army broke out and Jim, he went, the old man backing him for three months. And all that I hear the old man say was, just as we turn to start away, well, goodbye, Jim, take care of yourself. Never was nothing about the farm distinguished, Jim. Neighbors all used to wonder why the old man feared wrapped up in it. But when Captain Figler, he writ back that Jim was the bravest boy we had in the whole darn regiment, white or black, that his fighting was as good as his farming's bad, and that he'd led with a bullet clean board through his tie and carried the flag through the bloodiest battle you'd ever seen. <laughs> The old man wound up a letter to him as Captain Red was that said, Tell Jim goodbye and take care of himself. Took the papers, the old man did, watching for Jim. Fully believing he'd make his mark some way, just wrapped up in it. Many a time the word had come and stirred him up like the tap of a drum. At Petersburg, for instance, where Jim read right into the cannons there and took them and pointed them the other way and sucked it home to the boys in gray as they scooted for timber and on and on. Jim, a lieutenant, but one arm gone. And the old man's words in his mind all day. Well, goodbye, Jim. Take care of yourself. Think of a private now, perhaps. We'll say like Jim. Let's clump clean up to the shoulder strap. Think of him with a war plum through. And the glorious old red, white, and blue are laughing the news. Down over Jim. And the old man bending over him. And the surgeon turning away with tears that hadn't leaked for years and years as the hand of the dying boy clung to his father's and the old voice in his ears. Well, goodbye, Jim. Take care of you. So a bit of bagpipes there from uh, John McColl called Campbell's Are Coming. And before that, we had uh, Russell Hunting reading a story called The Old Man and Jim, backed with uh, Julius Levy on Cornet, I think, with The Last Rose of Summer, a s- sad story about a, a, a man's son going off and uh, being uh, mortally wounded in the war. Um, that's the, the kind of thing people listen to for entertainment in these days. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because obviously there is a popular market for, if not anti-war, then certainly music dwelling upon the sadness of war, but still our national poets and our national authors and the rest of it seem to be extolling the great virtues of war, mm. thumping the table and all the rest of it. So it it's interesting. There is a uh, like dichotomy, a yes. I believe we call it, yeah, uh, between those two, which should, you could say is still around now. There's a glorification of war mm. still going on even to today, and uh, still horror at the horrors of war um, still going on today. So maybe not not a lot has changed. Mm. Um, of course, at this time, Britain is involved in many different. Uh, spheres of influence around the world with the British Empire Mm -hmm. and uh, especially in India we have quite a lot of influence on the national kind of culture at this time because it's the the height of the Raj you could say the end of end of this century there's a few famous writers came out of this of course one of those of course is Rudyard Kipling and uh, this year saw the release of the Jungle Book the first Jungle Book there's Mm -hmm. a first and second Jungle Book but it's, a, it's an interesting book because obviously it is, Kipling has drawn a lot from Indian stories. It's obviously, he, critics seem to think he's picked up this idea of talking um, 
uh, animals and all the and all this kind of language from India, but it is very much an examination of English society with order in the centre and this idea of how you have to respect authority and everyone is in their proper place, etc., uh, hmm. etc. Et so it's a bizarre mix. However, it is the most popular of Kipling stories. It's considered the least problematic of all his works. I think even if you criticise Kipling for the way he portrays Indian society, hmm. I think you would agree it's a good story um, and spawned some excellent films. So, you know. The 1960s one. Yes, I think absolutely. It's my favourite. Um, it's, a, it's a strange book because you kind of remember the Mowgli stories but it's kind of it's a why it's called the Jungle Book is because it's a it's a selection of different stories and some of them are not with the jungle at all there's one with uh, seals yes um, trying to avoid getting uh, killed and uh, this, yeah one seal trying to find a new place where they won't get massacred and um, there's a uh, Ricky Tiki Tavi mm. who is a mongoose defending a family against a snake and her children uh, by killing different snakes, mm. um, it's quite a quite a selection of different things there. Some of some which work better than others, um, but yeah, it's it's worth a read, I would say. Um, and it was popular instantly, I think. Mm. Let's have a final thing from uh, eighteen ninety four, and uh, of course the the big thing still is this marching band music. Mm. This one, I think, is a. a bit different because it's uh, a bit more jolly than usual and it's got a virtuoso solo performance from uh, Arthur Pryor I believe who played the saxophone and cornet and uh, it's the the United States Marine Band of course which is uh, nominally led still by uh, John Philip Sousa I think Arthur Pryor took over as leader in this year actually Mm. and uh, it's called The Enthusiast Polka. That was called the Enthusiast Polka. It's the United States Marine Band once again. Um, and I think you can really hear that solo makes so much difference as far as I'm concerned from mm. uh, Arthur Pryor. Um, the whole marching band thing is all about being uh, well regimented and all playing together and not it's the opposite of working around solos. Mm. So I think it make, it kind of makes all the difference there and we can hear not... I wouldn't say the beginnings of jazz. It's still kind of far off, but it's another small shift towards uh, a different style of music and uh, a style of music that we can appreciate much more in the modern day. So what happened to Sousa after he left? Sousa was still around. Sousa was still uh, writing and uh, touring. He, he had his own band still, and uh, he, he just didn't believe in recorded music. He said it was canned music and uh, refused to be involved in it. Mm. So he was he was still around, and even into the 20th century, he was still uh, writing compositions which are still fairly well known, and uh, one of which we'll hear a little bit later. Um, so let's move on to 1895, shall we? 
Um, So what what kind of developments do we have in 1895? Well, in January the 12th, the National Trust was founded. Very good. uh, Very good. Um, You know. They are, a, what were they initially, National Trust? I think they just bought up a few houses. Yes, it's kind of the, I don't think it was necessarily for visiting in the way that it is today, but that was the founding. We have the Italo-Ethiopian War this year when uh, Italy invades Ethiopia for the first time. Um, okay, so just, the beginnings of the Second World War yes, even, we're getting towards that. Yes, the... we'll see, we are getting hallmarks of that. The Cuban War of Independence starts on February the 25th. Okay, so the Cuban War of Independence from uh, the colonial power, which yes. is Spain, Spain, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that, that leads on to various other things in a couple yes, of years' time. Yes, yes. Um, uh, in, later on in the year, we have uh, Brooker T. Washington delivers the Atlanta um, address, which is effectively him saying that if the white people will agree to educate the black men, they won't agitate for too many political rights mm, um, still a still a controversial figure still I believe. a still very much a controversial figure though he mm. was supported at the time um though for obvious reasons afterwards mm. support for that particular arrangement fell um another news the treaty of and i am gonna mother this shino seki ends the first sino japanese war and this it's is, a famously bad yes. treaty from China, yes. from a Chinese point of view. Yes, it is. But ironically, um, opposition to this treaty in China springs up and becomes the nucleus of what's called the Hundred Days of Reform, which is a brief mm. period of time at the turn of the 20th century, mm. when uh, China begins to liberally reform before a strong conservative reaction. I think from the Chinese point of view, this is kind of a terrible time for China. Mm. We have uh, this woman, uh, Cixi, in the, she's the empress dowager. She's not the empress. Mm. Uh, they, they don't have empresses in China, really. Um, but she's in charge, and uh, she's notorious in China for being a terrible leader. Mm. She uh, raised a lot of uh, money to uh, fight off the Japanese in this particular war, and she spent it on a, a big ivory boat. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's the, the kind of thing that she would do. We might come on to her more in uh, future years. She still has some of her worst things to come, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, yeah, what else do we have? Uh, we have the Dreyfus Affair, which finally comes to its sad conclusion this year. Oh. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about that later as well. Well, let's talk about it briefly. So the Dreyfus Affair this is the great political scandal of the Third French Republic between 1894 and 1906. Mm-hmm. Captain Alfred Dreyfus, a young... Alsatian French of Jewish descent, so he's, um, mm. he would be considered a Jew, was convicted of being a traitor and given life imprisonment on an island for supposedly selling secrets to the Germans. In 1906, about 10 years later, information came to light which showed that actually Dreyfus has absolutely, was absolutely nothing to do with selling of these secrets. He had been set up. Mm. Um, but this divided French society at the time, um, some sort as a mark of the anti-Semitism that was still was riven in French you know, French society at that time, other people said, no, he's a traitor and we should just execute him effectively. Mm. But this does show the rise of anti-Semitism, I would argue, that there is an increasing amount of anti-Jewish feeling across Western Europe, which, of mm. course, again, as talking about future events, does tie in to World War II somewhat later. Mm. So we're midway through the decade now. Yep. That seems to have come quite quickly, thankfully. <laughs> um, so where are we then? We're on the up on the whole, aren't we? So um, we've got these uh, clockwork motors coming in now and uh, disc recordings, which have been really taking off in this year. And that means that the volume of surviving recordings is increasing exponentially now. So we get a better selection of music we can listen to, is what it means as far as we're concerned. Um, think Faced with competition on multiple fronts, Edison has finally done the unthinkable and accepted the reality of a demand for a music industry, with Ugh. artists producing recordings for discerning listeners, rather than just a selection of artists making things that he's decided that they should record, or well, not him, but uh, his uh, his staff. But therein lies the catch, of course. Um, Edison and his competitors and the vast majority of record buyers, they still reside in uh, what the writer David Wondrich calls Upworld, and uh, their tastes naturally reflect the most conservative middle-brow elements of what has elsewhere been called the naughty, the naughty 90s. <laughs> Um, at best, this means collectible curios. At worst, more of these interminable sentimental ballads, which I'm not playing to you. <laughs> um, what it certainly didn't mean was artistry, either of the sophisticated European sort or of the perhaps more interesting underworld variety, that is, uh, the music being played 
in various dances and uh, places, especially around uh, New Orleans and the south of the USA, which we'd love to be able to play you now, <laughs> but none of which was recorded. So uh, what could be more middlebrow then than the banjo? Um, <laughs> a, originally an adaptation of traditional African instruments made by slaves in plantations. Can you believe it? Uh. That's where the banjo comes from. It had taken a bizarre route via touring minstrel shows and parlour lessons to be the instrument of choice for middle class white amateurs who would play it in their in their minstrel shows and things like that. And uh, the black people who developed it in the first place would have nothing to do with it by this point. So it's kind of strange how it's mm. gone completely 180 degrees. Um, and uh, the king of the banjo in this time is uh, Mr. Vess L. Osman. Uh, Vess kind of strange first name it's short for sylvester wow. sylvester vess i guess i don't know any sylvesters sylvester osman sylvester l osman lots of uh one initial middle names as well in this time you find an americanism doesn't that to have a yeah that's how that's how they name themselves it seems but vess l osman is a brilliant musician he's uh skilled and accomplished enough that he was uh, taking on different kinds of uh themes and styles from around the world you know this is a something we'll see time and time again his influence this time he's trying to take on ragtime themes ragtime is still in its very early days at this point really we kind of think of ragtime as being piano music um mm. these days but that's not ragtime really as it was um and vessel osman is uh not yet bringing out that stuff into his music but later on, quite soon, in our next episode, we will hear that he's making the first ragtime records that we have. But for now, let's have a listen to him showing off some of this kind of uh, virtuoso musicianship, which is taking over from the kind of regimented marching band kind of era. And uh, this is called the uh, Coconut Dance. There's Vessel Osman, virtuoso banjo player from New York, in America, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, what, what did you make of that? It's kind of a, I, I feel like it's a step forward again yes. in uh, recorded music. We are getting away from the... Marching bands. From the marching bands. Mm. Having said that, <laughs> <laughs> we will be coming back on to a marching band in a moment. Let's first of all talk about some more popular culture of uh, 1895. Um, what kind of uh, novels do we have out this year? Well, of course, famously, we have H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Oh, OK. A classic wow. of early, I don't know if we can call it sci-fi, but... Yeah, it, it's you, science you know fiction, I mean? yeah. Um, effectively posits the idea of what if you invented a time machine... And you go forward in time to when human society has devolved in between the... Uh, Morlocks, aren't they? The Morlocks who are the working class who live underneath the ground, living the, the, the these brutish, intelligent things operating the levers of society. When upstairs there are the Eloi, 
The Eloi. 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 I find it, I found it strange that the Eloi are stupid. Yeah, I suppose what he was trying, I think what he was trying to suggest was that without fear, without needing to work, human intelligence is, is nothing. Mm-hmm. But you're right, it is interesting that it's the working class, although brutish, seem to have the intelligence and the mm. leisured classes have devolved into nothingness. Then again, anyone who's watched Made in Chelsea may suggest that that's... Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's strange reading this, because uh, the... He, the time traveller goes forward in time and he uh, he meets the Eloi first and mm. there's one called Wiener yeah. and he kind of takes her with him. Mm. But is she like his girlfriend or like his pet? I think it's more of a pet, though there is a, an unauthorised sequel where they have children. But I think given her childlike right. intelligence, that'd be a bit weird. Yeah, I got very strange vibes from that yeah. particular aspect of it, <laughs> I have to say. Okay, so we've we've had some virtuoso kind of things going on let's uh go back to the old marching band music yeah. <laughs> we still oh, yes. we still have not escaped that of course and uh this is a a song written by john philip sousa but it's performed by baldwin's cadet band of boston we're going a little bit away from new york now um Finally. to boston uh, not not that far obviously um and uh this is uh, called the liberty bell you might find this familiar let's see if you find this familiar at all So was that familiar to you at all? That's Monty Python. Yeah, that's the Monty Python theme. Um, why do you think they chose that as their theme tune? It's an uh, odd selection. It's uh, nothing to do with uh, late 60s, early 70s British comedy, as far as I can tell. Probably why they chose it, in all honesty. I guess it's out of copyright. It's mm. kind of a fun, bouncy kind of melody and sounds a bit odd. But it's uh, interesting to hear it in the context it was originally written with all these other marching band songs. Um, it, does it acquire a slightly different cadence from that? But we don't just have music from the upworld. We do have music from uh, black society a little bit. Uh, we have a sort of proto-gospel thing here. Um, again, actual black artists, which we don't no. have that many of. Um, they're called the Oriole Quartet. It's a uh, proto-gospel in that it's quoting a Bible verse. Mm. Um, it's sort of... Uh, the kind of music we would later come to call barbershop, although that was a later invention, um, and they were a touring singing group. Let's have a listen to that. It's called uh, Brother Michael, Won't You Hand Down That Rope, which is a quote from a Bible verse. I'm not sure which one exactly. If you are particularly religious, those words might mean something to you. It's a it's a nice enough piece anyway. Here we go. Brother Michael, won't you hand down that
The Oriole Quartet there with some pretty interesting uh, vocal harmonies. You could call it kind of barbershop or gospel. I'm not sure what you would exactly. The vo- the vocal groups that were touring at this time. Um, and it's a strange kind of thing they've got going on there. He was saying they've got uh, the same kind of singing voice as uh, other acts. Yeah. Yeah. But I, th- I feel like they had uh, this... Um, African-American vernacular English, we would call it these days, this uh, dialect thing is going on, this chillin', that that kind of thing, which in some ways, if it's a, if it's a white group doing that, it's a, you think it's kind of a, a racist parody, but from an actual African-American group, you can see the connection between the the parody and the, the real thing they're doing there. The extent to which they were making this for a white audience is another question. Um, how much that is true or not, I, I, it's beyond what I can say, really. Mm. But it is interesting to hear all those kind of harmonies and different things they're doing with their voices there. Lots of uh, variation there. Yeah, There's lots going on in literature in this year. Uh, is there any, any other things you'd like to speak about? Yes, of course. Uh, we have The Importance of Being Earnest, which is Oscar Wilde's last... His last play, play. indeed. Yeah. Yes, and um, most famous play. Yes, his most famous play. Uh, the pinnacle of his professional achievement, but quickly followed by some personal downfalls, put it that way. It was during during its, its yes. uh, showing that yes. uh, there was a... A libel case. The Marquess of Queensbury, uh, whose son, Lord Alfred Douglas, was Oscar, was Wilde's lover at the time, mm. um, planned to attend the opera with a bouquet of rotten vegetables to present to Wilde to, I don't know, make some kind of point about spoiling things, I'm sure. Um, wow. He was denied ent- He was denied entrance... Um, to the theatre, obviously, but in the ensuing lawsuit, it came out that Oscar Wilde was gay. Uh, homosexuality at this time was still a crime in the United Kingdom, and he was mm. locked up and sentenced to two years hard labour. Um, yeah, which destroyed him in the end, didn't it? Destroyed him, yeah. So his already fragile constitution led to a lot of uh, wonderful art. And I, I, I like the importance of being earnest mm. as well. I think maybe people, when people are assessing his work, they usually go to um, the Ballad of Reading Jail and things like that as a uh, that's the, the the greatest art he created, but I think uh, the importance of being earnest is. Uh, I think there's pe- people kind of underestimate you know, farces. That I think mm. the the way that it's, it's stitched together is is beautiful, you know, and it's mm. uh, it it's really a wonderful way. It's all it all ties together so well, um, and uh, yeah, you can kind of forget that when you. When it, it does seem like a light piece at the same mm. time, but and and it it is a light piece, but I, I really enjoy watching a production of that let's have one final bit of uh, marching band music uh, we have still have had quite a bit of this i think this is the last time it's going to dominate quite so much this is something from Sousa's band again oh. this is without Sousa himself of course and uh i'm, I'm playing it because it is a bit more jolly and fun to listen to than uh, the other marching band pieces it's called the yazoo dance <laughs>
centuries of sound on Cambridge 105 Radio. Let's go over to France. There's a famous uh, poster from uh, Toulouse-Lautrec of this guy, um, Aristide Brandt. Um, you know, the Le Chat Noir, is, it says. Yes. If you go and have a look for uh, Le Chat Noir or uh, Aristide Brandt, you'll see there's a, a famous poster of this time. It's a golden era for Paris in terms of uh, cabaret and art at this mm. time. Uh, but maybe people don't know that he was also a recording artist at this time, and uh, yeah, not a not a bad one either. Le Chat Noir is uh, the Black Cat is the name of the first cabaret, and this is its theme song. La lune était sereine, sur le boulevard, je vis poindre ce tête qui me dit cher Oscar, d'où viens-tu vieille branche Moi je lui répondis, c'est aujourd'hui dimanche, et c'est de bonne année. Je cherche fortune autour du chat noir, au clair de la lune, à mon meurtre. Mademoiselle Claire, à qui je murmurais, comment vas-tu la belle Très bien, et vous, merci. À propos, me dit-elle, que cherchez-vous ici Je cherche fortune autour du chat noir, au clair de la lune, à mon bar. Quand j'aperçus dans l'ombre deux grands yeux qui brillaient, une voix de robe me cria Mon Dashka, que vous y prenez, jeune homme, que faites-vous, moi, rien Je cherche fortune autour du chanoir, au clair de la lune, à mon bar. You've been listening to Centuries of Sound. I've been James. And I've been Sean. This time we've been covering the years 1894 and 1895. So what have you made of the years 1894 and 1895 in general then? Well, I think in musical terms, I think we're finally moving, I hesitate to use the word modern, but there's music which is not just marching band music, which is always nice to hear. Well, there were, there were, there were sentimental yeah. ballads before. Yes. Yeah, we, we're, we're getting into stuff that's a bit better. It's the first signs of it rather than mm. anything hugely interesting mm. so far. But um, next time we're going to be taking a, a stride forward in, that ter- in those terms. Centuries of Sound, as well as being a radio show, is a website. I make mixes of uh, every year, and so far I'm up to the year 1910. So if you want to check that out, you can come along to our website, which is at centuriesofsound.com. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as well, and you'll get all the updates. This show will be up on Mixcloud as well, so you can uh, listen to all our mixes on Mixcloud as well. Let's finish off today with something more from Russia, 
Uh, we have a famous writer from uh, this kind of era is Tolstoy. What's Tolstoy up to at this kind of time? In the 1870s, Tolstoy underwent a profound moral crisis followed by a spiritual awakening, is what he'd call it. So we're yeah. now into his second phase, I suppose you could call it, when he's very interested in non-violent resistance. In fact, the, the work he wrote in 1894, The Kingdom of God is Within You, uh, had an impact of men such as Martin Luther King, Gandhi... Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It talks oh, okay. effectively about how you need to resist authority, but passively rather than aggressively um, to bring the kingdom of God about within everyone. Okay. Um, wow. So, it's yeah. Very different stuff from him. Well, yes. not, not so different in a sense, but uh, yeah, uh, interesting. But we also made some recordings uh, yeah. of his spoken voice rather than singing or anything. Um, so we have the, some of the usual selection of Russian cylinders here from the collection of Julius Block again, which of course, again, succeed in effortlessly outclassing the competition. We have the old guard here represented by Paul Pabst only two years before his sudden death. And we have the future in the shape of 19-year-old Joseph Hoffman, uh, both playing sublime piano music with the words of Leo Tolstoy mixed behind from time to time. Thank you. 
If you enjoy these programs, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. For $5 or local equivalent per month, you can get full downloads of mixes and these radio podcasts a year earlier. Centuries of Sound is an independent podcast without any advertising, and it's only with the support of patrons that the show can survive. Find out more at patreon.com slash centuriesofsound.